from channeling. Uh, people who channel, like uh, Jay-Z Knight and all these other people, well, a lot of them, I think, are just frauds and, and con men, con women. But to the extent that there is some kind of genuine channeling take place, it's, it's prolix. It's just, it, it just goes on and on forever. Whereas the nature of this downloads, of the Gaian downloads from Sophia, are very, very concise and rigorous. And then the challenge is, you, to, 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 you, you're being given a jewel of lucidity, a jewel of thought, a jewel of realization. This is called a, a Dakini elixir, a jewel elixir. And then the challenge is to actually live and practice that elixir and integrate it into your experience. And this is an absolutely fantastic path that is now opening to us as, as Gaia awakens and she is reaching toward us because uh, we are part of her solution and part of her correction. Right. And as I understand through your reading, it's not about letting your mind go blank for silent knowing. No. Your psychonautics webpage discuss of the organic light and how it requires some sort of focused attention. It does hand. indeed. Right. That's right. It does. In and fact, the practice of telestic shamanism, te the, the telestic is from the word telos, T-E-L-O-E-O-S, which means a name. Telestic shamanism which was the practice of the pagan seers in the mysteries, is very simply this. While you're in your ordinary state of rational thinking and logic and intellect, which Castaneda called the first attention, while you're in that state and you're sitting around with a group of your buddy shamans, you define a name. You define a name, say, I want to go to the organic light and I want to uh, explore the nature of of fire. Just to give an example. Or I want to, uh, I want to know, uh, about, uh, the oak trees. What is an oak tree? What is the properties of an oak tree? Uh, you, you, you form a specific aim. This is often the aim to learn something. And you f form that before you go into the state. So then, when you're in the practice, there is a carryover. Then when you find yourself in the altered state, standing and encountering the organic light, you retrieve your question and you put it to the light. This is called telestic shamanism because it is a directed, directed form of shamanism with a specific intention. Thank you, John. I appreciate that. Next time I try it, though, I'm going to make sure my wife's out of town. <laughs> <laughs> sure. John. Um, just a yeah. quick question. Basically, um, we, we did speak to a gentleman by the name of Leonard Horowitz yesterday, and he's obviously got some interesting ideas on regards to a six sulfido frequencies. I was wondering when you were talking about the actual methods, could they have something to do with how this transmits into our medium, you know, the 528 hertz frequencies, etc.? Yeah, it could. And, uh, in fact, that just came up to me the other day. I hadn't heard about this 528 hertz. Uh, but I'm going to investigate it, and uh, there's a chance that it may fit into the picture here. I'll tell you what I know at present, okay? I know yep. that Gaia is trans transmitting to us as if through a radio console of 16 channels, and you can hear each one of these channels. It's more Her communication is more a clairaudient one. So you can hear and register each one of these channels, uh, pick it up with your own antenna, as it were. And uh, I haven't investigated it at this point. I've, I've been communicating with the channels and showing other people how to do the same with, a surprising, surprising to say, uh, a pretty good rate of success so far. I haven't investigated how these channels might be described in terms of hertz frequencies, but I would uh, be happy to do that uh, very soon. Thank you, John. Um, the next question we have is from Uranus Rising. Sure. John, you've written that the Gnostics rejected the Persian duality of good and evil, but instead had their own theory, that of error. This theory suggests that we evolve by learning, especially learning by our mistakes. And there is a wide latitude for error, which typifies human singularity. That by allowing our mistakes to go undetected and uncorrected, 
our singularity becomes destructive. But given that most people are so immersed in the archonic intrapsychic influence that causes error to run wild and to live in the false belief that the ego is God and that, yeah. it's, and that we should be perfect. It sets us up to fear our errors as they feel like a death. So would you briefly but properly explain the Gnostic theory of error for us? And my question is, is there anything to offer to those of us who are caught in that archonic intrapsychic dynamics of good and evil, especially if they find themselves in the states of fight, flight, or being frozen from fear. Wow. This is so deep and so, so critical. So critical to the threshold or the precipice, I guess would be a better word, uh, where the human species now finds itself as for a paraphrase of the Gnostic theory of error, I, I commend you. I mean, you gave a brilliant paraphrase, and uh, you, you, you got in all the key points. When we were engineered and conceived as a product of the imagination of Sophia in the galactic core, before this uh, divine potential of humanity was, was seeded in the limbs so that it could emerge in, in, in a, a range of planetary settings, uh, Sophia and the other aeons encoded into us a high factor of monogenes. That's the Greek word, monogenes. Uh, singularity. And you, you say beautifully, uh, one of the features of our singularity is that we are a learning species. We're, uh, we're a storytelling species and a learning species. And we have what makes us different not superior to whales and iguanas and, and bees and snails and slugs and tigers and uh, elephants and horses, is that all those other animals have a limited instinctual singularity. They have a limited singularity defined by their instinctual format. So within their instinctual formats, monarch butterflies, for instance, who fly up and down the coast of, uh, of uh, California, down to Mexico and back, or, or birds that migrate here across the Straits of Gibraltar, down into Africa, uh, to exact places, like almost the same trees, and then navigate back again to Europe. How can they do that? Because Gaia, who is the mother of those species, the, uh, uh, the creator, artistic creator, gives them a singularity but it is restricted to a very narrow scale, field of operation, and therefore their behavior is, in a sense, more perfect than ours. They don't have a margin for error. We have a huge margin for error, and that's where we get in trouble. And as you said, the essence of this Gnostic theory of error is so brilliant. We need to make mistakes, because in seeing our mistakes, we correct ourselves, and that's how we really learn. Learning is a self-correction process. But if we allow our errors to go undetected, they extrapolate beyond the scale of correction. And we go nuts. And we become destructive. And we totally lose it. And we do things like create, you know, construct 55 nuclear power plants on the most earthquake-prone zone in the world. This is what we do. And millions of other things. I would, we would be exhausted giving the examples. You bring up such an important point, and I've not had anyone raise this before. What can we do about the fact that people are so terrified to admit their mistakes? You know, I just had an incident, and I and I have this happens to me all the time. I just had an incident with someone in you know, a personal relationship, someone I saw uh, for a few months as a friend, two or three months, and uh, then the relationship ended, which is fine with me. You know, nothing lasts forever, and I expect relationships to begin and end, and a relationship for of, of two months or two weeks or two hours with a human being can be rich and rewarding. The fact that it ends uh, does not detract from that. But it ends badly when someone is not able to admit that they made mistakes there's no way to correct the relationship. There's no way, there's no closure. There's no way to go on with a healing attitude. I mean, you know, 
uh, it, it makes it very, very difficult to pull out of those kind of situations. Uh, and as you suggest, uh, you know, humanity at large is in this situation where people who are unwilling to admit their own wrong or their own errors or mistakes are, are not going to be able to see it in others. You know, they, when they see it in the, in the government, in the authorities, uh, by the way, Archon is another word for authorities. Uh, authorities is another translation for Archon, by the way. When they see the authorities doing things which are clearly wrong, in error, insane, harmful, and they, you know, and they don't go and confront the authorities on their error. Uh, I don't really have an answer except to tell you a kind of supernatural answer. But before I give you that, I'd like to make a, a, a very, uh, I'd like to make a Gnostic qualification. When I give you a supernatural answer, it doesn't mean that I'm asking you to take anything on faith. It means that from my experience, I understand that certain things that are happening and can happen with the human species depend on a supernatural input into our reality. We are interacting with the supernatural. Don't ask you to take that on faith. For me, it's a matter of fact. And for you, it can be fact as well. You can verify what I'm saying. Supernaturally, there's a selection process happening right now, and it's rigorous. There is not going to be a collective or mass awakening, as far as I can tell. There never has been. If you're looking for a quantum shift to uh, flood through the human species, I suppose it could happen. We're a, a species of novelty and singularity. It could happen. I won't rule it out. But there's one thing that I can assure you is happening. And that is that the Dakini forces of Gaia, she has uh, these Dakini energies or frequencies, are selecting from the human species those who can merge into Gaia's correction and those who can't. And I hate to sound like an eugenicist, and please uh, give me a lot of slack here, folks, because I'm not a eugenicist, and I don't believe in the concept of culling the human race, but there is a kind of splitting of the ways taking place. Uh, the Hopi prophecy is one of the few indigenous teachings that I would cite that might help us to understand Gaia's correction. And the Hopi prophecy says that, that human reality splits into two realities which go in two completely different directions at the same time. And so there is no way that you and I, as human beings, are ever going to sort this out. I can't even have a moment of truth with another person. I mean, that's all I want. I don't want much from the human species or any other person, man or woman. I just would like to have, I would like to reach you in total naked honesty and have a moment of truth with you. That's what I seek from every person that I meet. And let me tell you, I don't get much of it. So I don't burden myself with uh, this syndrome of fear and this deplorable, shabby behavior of human beings that they cannot admit their mistakes. I don't burden myself with that. I, I attempt to raise my mind 